We're going to get started uh, with a uh, new session. Um, we had a first uh, uh, start with uh, the technical considerations. So we heard uh, quite a bit from uh, Anna, Michael, and, and uh, Adrian on how to tackle the, the technical aspects and consider the technical uh, complexities when we look at the energy and water planning. And now we would like to move at uh, uh, you know, at a discussion with um, Electricité de France and um, Avengoa on uh, what is sort of the private sector role when we look at the energy water nexus and the stresses. What are the challenges that these companies uh, face to, to reach out to governments in, in respect to these policies? Um, what, are, what are some of the initiatives of the business community uh, to try and tackle some of these issues. So we're going to start with with Laurent uh, Bellet. He's a water and energy specialist with uh, EDF, and he's uh, coordinating a very interesting uh, water for energy framework initiative that uh, is answering a few of the questions that were also raised uh, yesterday, particularly in, with respect to um, data harmonization, the use of indicators and metrics, uh, and I think uh, trying to have a, a common framework and, and a common set of uh, uh, concepts that the, the community works with uh, is quite important. And I think this initiative uh, has that particular goal. But Laurent, why don't you tell us a bit about this initiative and uh, how the business community is looking at this, particularly as it, as it partners with uh, international groups and uh, governments. No? Thank you. Thanks, Diego. So, uh, first of all, to uh, introduce my uh, subject and to answer to the question about uh, why uh, electric utilities in, is interested in the water and energy nexus, uh, the equation is very simple. It means uh, no water means no energy. So, it, the equation is very simple. The resolution of this equation is very complicated. So, it's why we uh, are leading this, uh, this project. So, this project is born uh, at the World Water Forum 6 in Marseille, so uh, one year ago, one, uh, nearly two years ago. And uh, the objective is uh, to uh, provide first result of this work at the next World Water Forum 7 in Daegu in 2015. So um, the, for an electric utilities like EDF, the main driver is the global change. Not only climate change, but global change and the increased pressure on uh, the water resources and uh, the change in the use of water, and also the change in legislation, taxation. So it is also an issue for, for us. And uh, we have to keep in mind that it is a shared resource, a shared risk, and a shared responsibility. So it's why we are trying to get the maximum of stakeholders in, in this uh, initiative to be sure that everybody will have a voice in this, uh, in this topic. So the main first idea is to really have a need um, for a common language, so to avoid to have a misunderstanding between uh, water use, water withdrawal, water evaporation, water abstraction, water consumption, and water footprint, which is now uh, an ISO uh, definition. Uh, the idea is really to focus for the first step on the, if you look at the right side of the slide, on the water for energy part of the, of the problem. So, and uh, to go beyond on the ongoing simple volume method and to really uh, uh, deal with the risk and the impact on the water of our activities, energy activities. Uh, the idea is really to be uh, as comprehensive as possible, practical, consistent, and usable for all energy sectors. Uh, so including uh, oil, gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, solar, wind, biomass, and geothermal. Uh, and to really uh, go from source to service means to take into account the different uh, life cycle step of the energy uh, process. So in terms of organization for the project, just to keep, uh, you know, to have a global overview, so uh, we are leading this project. We have an international steering committee with uh, 12 uh, different members, including uh, some who are in the room, here is Cheng, for instance, from Greenpeace. 
Uh, and we have also an advisory council with the World Energy Council and the World Water Council because the idea was really to have a concrete example of collaboration between the two sectors, which was not the case before the World Water Forum in Marseille, and to, uh, to work with the scientific and institutional community with APRI, the HE, CWE, World Bank, and all those and uh, to have energy champions for each sector uh, with the different association representing these different sectors, so the World Nuclear Association, the IHA, International Allo Power Association, uh, World Bioenergy Association, the World Coal Institute, and uh, still to be defined for the oil and gas sectors. So the idea is really to embark on this project all uh, the different energy sectors and uh, with the leadership, with uh, the representative association of these sectors. So um, there is a leaflet on the table just at the outlet of the, of the room so uh, with some details. And uh, the platform, the web platform for this project is an, uh, the European Innovative Partnership on Water platform. So we use this platform because we have been selected as an action group. Nine action group has been selected by the European Commission. And this project is one of these uh, nine action groups. So we decided to use this platform as an exchange platform for, for a project. So all the details are in this leaflet and on this platform with the contact and the, the, the location of the site. So I think that's it. I don't want to enter too much in detail because it can uh, last one hour or more. So <laughs> if you have any global question, I can answer. If you have detailed question, I propose you to to, to have a look on the different documents of the project which are on the platforms, world platforms. Great. Thanks, uh, Laurent, for the, uh, keeping it short. <laughs> uh, I think we have uh, a few minutes for a couple of uh, questions on the initiative. I think it's, uh, for us it's, it's quite an interesting initiative and it really shows the value of, uh, of you know, partnerships uh, from different um, disciplines and, and, and angles and we hope that uh, it has a, a fruitful outcome as well in terms of trying to harmonize some of this uh, thinking as well. Uh, any questions? No? Great. I hope uh, maybe... Oh, Anna. One question. If for each of the technologies you have, um, like for coal, you have the coal association, for yeah. hydro, the hydro, international yeah. hydro association, well, don't you think that their conclusions will be a little bit biased? Or do you, how, do you explain, can you explain a little bit how do you check the, the factors they come up with? Like if, I don't know, like if there's peer review or like other people will check it. Because I'm assuming that then the coal association will say, well, coal requires this amount of water, but maybe uh, it's less, right? Because like they are, they have interests. So yeah. how do you check that the factors yeah. are correct? Yeah, you can explain. Yeah, okay. So in fact, the role of uh, this energy champion is really to uh, to, to push and uh, ensure coherence and mobilize the, the members of the association in the project. But we are providing uh, with the material and the definition and so on to be sure that the coherence between the definition, between the methodology and so on uh, will be applicable. But the, the main objective, for instance, for the next month is to organize different workshops by sectors and to involve this, uh, these people in, the, in this workshop in order to have uh, the, the feedback from their uh, perspective and their input and to be sure that it could be uh, relevant and usable by this sector. And just another detail I forgot to say also, what is important is at the end of the day we will have a set of indicators and not one only indicators, uh, like the Water Footprint Network, for instance, which, are, which is also involved in the steering committee of this project because it is uh, important. But uh, we think for the energy sector it's not relevant to have only one figure. Mm. And so we think it's really important to have a set or a matrix of indicators uh, depending on the, the volume, the quality, the impact on users and ecosystems and so on. Any other questions? Or we move uh, Okay, thanks, Laurent. I, there's uh, plenty of time today to, to follow up if, if needed. Yeah. Uh, now we move to Paula Darbe. He's a Deputy Strategy Relations uh, uh, director in, in Abengoa and, and also a partner in our Thirsty Energy Initiative. 
extensive experience they have, in, uh, particularly in renewable energies in very arid regions. They have done a lot of work in Morocco and South Africa, implementing actually uh, energy plants. Uh, so um, Paul is going to tell us a bit um, what is their experience and, and their work also on the water and energy and how to reduce some of the dependency on the resource. No? So Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Diego. First of all, first of all uh, uh, I want to say that uh, we are really committed with this uh, initiative with uh, Diego and, and the World Bank. Uh, I hope I can make you understand why and uh, uh, along this, this presentation. So first, uh, as a small introduction of uh, who we are and uh, what we do, I think that uh, today here in, in this room, uh, everyone has uh, a different role in, in, this, uh, in, in, in this sector, and uh, everyone has have his own uh, responsibility on that. So we, as Avengoa, we are in the, in the in the cake, in the part of the engineering and construction of, uh, of new projects. So uh, here uh, in the table we have uh, EDF, that is in the utility. They have uh, uh, a very important uh, role in this sector, and we provide these solutions for, for utilities. So uh, there are decision makers also from the political uh, level. So everyone in his room has uh, their own uh, responsibility on that. And we at Engoa, we are in the part of the engineering construction. And also, we, we, we manage long-term uh, uh, infrastructures that uh, has a long-term agreement with, with our clients. So we somehow operate uh, our, um, assets uh, in this way. So what, what we do in Avengoa, we are in energy and water, but in, uh, especially in, in in, in, in parts of the business that there is a, a, technolo a technological component. What does it mean that? We think that uh, by providing technology, uh, we add value to, to solutions. And we have a, a strong uh, uh, R&D department that is feeding with uh, innovative solutions to the engineering construction uh, division, and then uh, we transfer to the concession times, uh, to the concession division. And in the concession, when we are operating these, these projects, is where we learn and we identify practical uh, solutions that then can retrofit to the, to the R&D and uh, close the, the cycle again. So uh, why we are here, and uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you in, in which uh, kind of uh, products are we involved. As you may see in this slide, we are truly focused in energy and water. And... Uh, <coughs> In, in the, I'm going to do an, an analogy in, in these two sectors. That is, uh, in both sectors, we have a generation uh, of, of the source. In, in energy, would be a power generation. And in water, we have uh, a generation also of the source, if we can call it like this. Like that would be uh, desalination or drinking water treatment. And then we have the, the transmission and distribution uh, system, both in energy and in water. So, um, and at the end, we deliver the, the water or the electricity to cities. So in, in Avengoa, we are in, in, in these two sectors, in the production uh, states and the transmission state. So this leads us in a strong position to maximize synergies, synergies between uh, two sectors. And uh, this is a strong bet that we are doing uh, in the last uh, years uh, to join efforts in energy and water and uh, try to understand how can we uh, deliver better solutions. I'm going to skip this slide because uh, most of it has been said so far. And I want to stop a little bit here. Uh, uh, we understand um, the business as, as this pyramid uh, that I'm showing here. In the very bottom, there, there would be the equipment uh, solutions or, or the equipment uh, manufacturers that they provide pumps or turbines or um, specific equipment. There are also in this level uh, technological integrators that they supply packages of solutions. And, uh, and in Avengoa, for instance, we are uh, basically in the level uh, two. That, that's where we integrate equipments and uh, technological packages. And at the very top, 
we find uh, systems that this infrastructure are connected to a system. So what I, I wanted to show this slide because uh, going back to the water and energy nexus, I think that there are opportunities in every level. So for the equipment, we, we can uh, find more efficient uh, equipment solutions like better efficient pumps or better performance turbines or uh, better water friendly cooling systems. That would be in the, in the bottom and the, the people that is here, they have the responsibility to, to work on that. Uh, at, the le at the second level uh, is where um, there will be a plan itself that we can uh, improve the overall plan performance and uh, plan design optimization that the people that we are here, we have the opportunity to improve on that. And at the top, we find systems. So when designing systems is when you can uh, take the decisions of, uh, uh, for instance, integration of re renewable energy with uh, fossil fuels, uh, for instance, uh, combined heat and power or district heating, energy storage. And uh, I want to uh, stress here because uh, the, the people that is uh, at the very top that is taking the decisions uh, of the system, which it's going to be the, the, the power plant fleet of a, of a country, it's, they have a, 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 a greater impact. So uh, as, as much as the top that we go, they, they will have uh, more impact in, the, in, the, in downstream. So here there is a call that in the private sector we should be involved in, in this level with the, the politics and uh, this uh, planning stage in order to, to provide our inputs and our experiences in order to, to make it possible. And uh, I will skip this only briefly that uh, we have been working in, uh, in a lot of uh, arid areas in, around the world, like the south of the uh, United States, south of Spain, uh, Middle East, Morocco, Argelia, uh, South Africa. And uh, to end up my presentation, a couple of examples to, to give some uh, color uh, at this uh, presentation. This is a, a project that we built in, uh, in Morocco. This is an integrated solar combined cycle that uh, it's about to integrate the solar field to a combined cycle power plant. Uh, we have here uh, an improvement of the efficiency of the plant by uh, heating up the, the, the steam with uh, solar, so uh, less consumption of fuel. And regarding water, since Morocco is a very uh, dry area, here uh, what we designed was uh, an advanced dry cooling system with a 95% reduction of, uh, of uh, water consumption. So that's an example that the technology is there. A combined cycle, that is one of the most efficient uh, technologies uh, of uh, fossil fire and uh, integrated with, with solar. So I think that can be a good example that what can be applied uh, in, in arid areas uh, around the world. And uh, to end up, the, this last example is a, a project in, in South Africa. Uh, this is a, a, a also a CSP uh, project with uh, tower technology and also is, uh, is using um, a dry cooling system that almost no water consumption. Uh, what we can do from now on, Diego, is uh, we can provide uh, real data of this, these projects because uh, I don't have time to collect all of this, but uh, every, every data that we can uh, take from real cases, we can provide it to, the, to this initiative. And also there is uh, another uh, highlight topic here that there is two hours of thermal storage. Uh, I wanted to, to come back to one uh, issue that Anna has raised before, that it seems that uh, CSP can be the, the aerial in, in renewable energies, but uh, we must say that have uh, uh, advantage, and uh, one of these is that uh, can store the energy and that can be used uh, when, the, when the market needs. Uh, for instance, uh, we, were be, we have been aware of a project in Chile.
así es este, es el tuyo. Ok, yeah, así que fue yours. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> ok. So, I, I, I was just uh, about, about to finish. And uh, I was talking about uh, a project that uh, we have in, uh, in Chile. That... <laughs> Okay. So uh, to end up, uh, okay. Ah. Yes. Uh, very interesting what I'm going to say now, eh? <laughs> after, <laughs> after this <Very> stuff. <laughs> so I, I was talking uh, about one project in, in Chile, also uh, CSP, that uh, uh, we, by using a new uh, development that is using molten salts direct, directly to, 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 uh, to pass through the receiver, we, we fit a storage system that can supply energy uh, that can store energy for 17 hours uh, per day, and uh, it can provide electricity by renewable energy 24/7 uh, every day that uh, we have uh, sunlight. So that was my last point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for uh, the, the pr presentation. Very interesting. Again, it shows a bit what uh, Mike was saying today, you know, that the utilities or the energy companies are really the ones who are sort of pushing some of these new technologies. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, but given that I have the mic in the hand, I want to start with uh, one. Uh, and it's mostly related to, um, without obviously giving uh, absolute figures, but uh, how do these uh, hybrids and these technologies affect your financial uh, sheet no? in the sense uh, when, you, when you're bidding for processes, for projects, and you have different technological options, do you see that in some cases, you know, financially they are extremely costly vis-a-vis -vis cheaper ones? I mean, if you can just cover that uh, very briefly. I mean, in general, you know, if you say CSP dry cooling is, you know, 10% more expensive in, I, I don't know the, the figures, but I suspect there's something along those ranges. I, I, you, we hear also that the dry cooling also is less efficient, no? and, uh, and there are these numbers of 4 to 5 percent losses in efficiencies. I mean, is that what you sort of see, you know, that you are really implementing these things, no? Uh, any other questions from... Okay. Yes, I'm going to try to answer in uh, overall uh, figures. So uh, today, uh, renewable energy is is more expensive than uh, that fossil. We all know know that. Uh, we are on the path that uh, we expect that in in six years, uh, CSP can compete with uh, with uh, fossil fuels without any. Uh, uh, grant from the the government, so this is the timeline that we are working six years. Uh, the hybridization, hybridization, for hybridization is in between of uh, of uh, fossil and renewables. So the countries, developing countries, we cannot expect that they are uh, using renewable energy, the most advanced technology, and uh, at the very beginning. So hybridization is in a step in between. So first we suggest to hybridization to the conventional uh, generation, and then we can go to full renewal, uh, renewal projects. Regarding the efficiency, uh, I'll give you the, these figures, but uh, dry cooling is, uh, is, is effective, and uh, it has been led us to develop projects in Morocco and South Africa. So uh, I will work on that to, to provide you those, the, your details, but it's, it's uh, a real solution. 
Thanks. Uh, any other comment or questions? Burning issues? No? Okay, thanks, uh, Laurent and uh, Paul, for the presentations. I, I invite um, Anuka, Kelly, and Alexander to join us. We start the, the last uh, block, uh, which is more on the on the government side. Um, we start with uh, with Anuka. She she's uh, with the UNECE, the Economic Commission for Europe, and uh, it's the only case. So I think the. In, particularly in this uh, couple of days, which has a transboundary nature. So we've been discussing a lot of uh, how do you implement the water and energy at the national level or, or project level, uh, but the complexities of transboundaries are, are really, really large. And UNEC has uh, been working on this new initiative for, for quite a while, so we're going to hear from Anuka how do the, they try to promote this integration of uh, the water and energy nexus in several countries, and, and when you have very complex uh, electricity systems and, uh, uh, and basins. So, Anuka, um, if, you can, uh, if you can start, uh, please. Le uh, let me give you the mic. Okay, so, good morning. Um, this Convention on the Protection and Use of um, Transboundary Watercourses and International Lakes, it's at present time framework for transboundary cooperation. It's framework for transboundary cooperation for some uh, 40 parties, at, and it's in the process of um, opening globally to, to become uh, available to all UN member states. So the parties of the convention uh, recognize these challenges uh, related to the resource nexus and decided on an uh, assessment uh, of selected river basins, transboundary river basins, to be carried out in the next uh, year and a half. And um, these, um, these basins are highly diverse in terms of which resources the scarce one, uh, the climatic zone, uh, etc. Mainly in, uh, they're mainly in pan-Europe, but also we, we foresee to look into some uh, some African and, and Asian case also. Um, the status is such that uh, the methodology has been developed. It's out there for uh, comments um, with, uh, from stakeholders. And uh, we've carried out uh, a piloting exercise, which I will tell briefly about. And um, Finland is the lead country for this work. And uh, the main partners are FAO and uh, the main expertise is from the Royal Institute of Technology in, in Stockholm. So these uh, transboundary risks and implications uh, we feel related to the nexus have not been adequately reflected on or, or are not being uh, recognized. Like it's, of course, uh, development is necessary in transboundary basins also, but it should be done with due consideration to the to the implications also on the other riparian countries. So we need to strike a balance between um, different uses and then uh, protection of the resource for, for sustainability. And what we need in a transboundary setting is really uh, increased understanding, dialogue and participation of the, of the relevant actors. And um, it's necessary to have effective institutions and uh, legal frameworks that are, uh, there's a balance to be struck between flexibility that has been called for, uh, like uh, when there are low flow situations that um, these uh, situations can be handled with minimal um, impacts, uh, minimal negative impacts, but also that there is kind of robustness that uh, investments can be confidently made that uh, that there's, uh, the countries have agreed, they are politically committed to cooperation um, on water allocation, <coughs> etc. So we need decision support tools, appropriate regulations, um, and political willingness, of course. And the process that has been developed for this assessment, it involves um, a desk uh, study, but also uh, questionnaires to identify the, the key, key issues and also the, perception, the perceptions and positions of the sectors. A key step is a basin level workshop that brings together the relevant sectors, uh, but also civil society and the private sector. 
And uh, there are indicators at two levels, the general ones uh, describing the sectors, but also specifically on the, on the interlinkages and, uh, and trade-offs. And this is a participatory interactive exercise. Uh, we really focus on the issues that, um, that the sectors um, and authorities uh, identify as, as important. And uh, this, all these assessments go through extensive consultation with the countries, but then also with the task force that has been set up to, to guide this work. And it um, has a significant capacity building function. So we use uh, these questionnaires, indicators, and also this, uh, uh, this workshop uh, process. I was, I was told to, to be fast, so I won't go into the details, but we use also like, spatial information to inform the discussions in the workshop and, and get reactions um, from the representatives of the, um, of the countries. So in the end of November, we had this uh, pilot workshop involving uh, the relevant sectors from Azerbaijan and, and Georgia, the ministries of environment, energy, agriculture. And there's also this, um, uh, like it, it's, it really underlines how important it is how water management is, is organized in country because it can be very different, can lean towards uh, different sectors that are, are priorities. Like in Azerbaijan, for example, as, as a consequence of some severe flooding, institutional change was made that it's the Ministry of Emergency Situations that it's, has the key role in water management now. So all these need to be taken into account. And from this workshop, uh, we noticed that uh, people participated in a very enthusiastic way in this uh, um, sort of identifying the linkages and what are the impacts. And, it seems clear that, uh, for example, in this basin, when the prediction is that uh, flash flooding is going to become more important with, uh, with climate change, this will um, aggravate the, um, the <laughs> sedimentation and erosion situation, which is already bad. And this um, leads into siltation of uh, reservoirs. And um, energy policy has got a role to play here because uh, uh, you, like urban areas are gasified, but uh, the local people often don't have access. They don't have economic means to, to, to benefit from this. So biomass is commonly used, and this, this uh, again, uh, makes the situation with erosion worse. So it's important to look at um, the um, compatibility of uh, the different sectors' plans and where do they clash, and, and what are the ways of dealing with the trade-offs when they occur. And um, it's, of course, it's easier to always focus on the kind of synergy, but the uh, fact is that there's not always win-win in every, every case. But uh, the different ways of improving the situation in this process, we, we try to have uh, the participants thinking what kind of actions would alleviate the, the negative in the, in the nexus and enhance the synergy, whether it's changes to current policies, whether it's uh, new policies, um, management uh, measures, how the infrastructure is being operated, in what mode, etc. And the particularity of uh, this case is that, uh, of course, there are development pressures, uh, justified ones, uh, it just should be done in a, in a proper way. And for example, now when Azerbaijan is uh, acquiring wealth from the hydrocarbon resources, they've got uh, means to improve water efficiency in the agriculture, and this would uh, uh, de decrease pressure on uh, natural resources. And uh, about the companies and operators, I just wanted to make the point that you just can't lump uh, private sector in uh, one bag because there's a kind of transition from the state because in many of these Eastern Pan-European countries that we deal with, they have companies and operators that are, that are kind of state, uh, state operators and they um, operate not only, not only on the sort of profit-making and economic uh, uh, conditions. And this is very timely, this assessment overall on the Alazani Ganich because uh, integrated water resources management plans uh, are being prepared um, by both countries with the global environment facilities support. And in this regard, we had a very good cooperation with um, Jeff uh, Kuraraks uh, project. 
And also there's now uh, negotiation ongoing about uh, um, establishing um, agreement on transboundary waters between Georgia and, and Azerbaijan. And it looks like we are hopeful that uh, there will be a multi-sector representation in this uh, eventual joint body that would support the implementation. But this is still in the, in the making. It's being negotiated. So what can governments do to ensure collection of relevant data and information? rational and predictable policy framework, of course, to, through permit uh, conditions, they have, uh, have influence. And uh, from procedure point of view, this uh, environmental impact assessment also in transboundary settings is um, important to, uh, to follow. And also the governments could um, take more seriously their influence, focus more on um, strategically um, planning in where, where infrastructure development should should play, could take place. And in this, of course, the scope of uh, mandate of joint bodies like river commissions is very diverse, but a broad constituency helps to ensure that uh, different interests are taken into account. And these channels and forms for dialogue and coordination, they often, uh, there are shortcomings there and this would need to be improved. But with this kind of processes, we hope to support the sharing of information and, and dialogue. And um, yes, that's, that's, that's it from me. Just want to say that uh, do take into account the other, the other sectors, as many speakers have, uh, have mentioned. It's not just, water is not a simple sector. It's really a cross-cutting uh, resource. Well, thank you, Anuka, very much. And you had to leave for an interview, so I will be taking over. Um, very interesting presentation. One question for me, uh, will the framework be available online so other countries that have similar um, problems can use it or did you, do you plan to distribute like the case studies? Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Everything is uh, put online on the UNEC Water Conventions uh, website. Okay, so are there any questions from the audience for Anuka? No questions. Okay, well, I guess it's time for Kelly. Kelly is working in the um, Department of State in the U.S., and she will be explaining a little bit the uh, national water and energy policies, how do they um, translate into local solutions, and what are the lessons that can be learned and can be applied to other countries with similar, similar issues. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. domestic experience, thank you, um, to, you. <laughs> to inform um, the dialogues that we're having um, with other countries internationally. So I just wanted to set that stage. Um, you heard from Mike earlier about um, some of the things that are going on in the United States, and so I just wanted to, to bring the discussion up to a little higher level and discuss national water policy um, in the United States and how that has influenced decision making on the energy water nexus. Um, as some of you may be aware, U.S. water rights policy is complicated. Uh, we don't have a national policy specifically. Um, it's broken into regions, and at a very high level, there are two different um, kind of doctrines that mandate the way that water uh, rights are managed in the United States. In the Western United States is something called the prior appropriation doctrine, um, and very simply, that means that the first people who got there, the first sector who got there, gets the first water rights. And so water is allocated in that way, and it actually originates from the Spanish system, um, as, that, as that was what was uh, influenced in the, in the West Coast. Uh, on the East Coast, we follow the riparian doctrine, um, which means that the water belongs to the landowner. Um, and this comes from basic water scarcity and basic water abundance between the two different sides of the United States. Um, and it has some, both of them have pros and cons, and, and the United States has been managing this uh, through time. The way that we manage water um, manifests itself in the energy water nexus in the United States. And this is just a map produced by the Union of Concerned Scientists. It's available online. And I recognize that you probably can't read it, 
but um, uh, just in generally, red means um, where there have been issues, yellow means um, where there's kind of a, a medium problem, and green means where there's been positive solutions um, to address the energy water nexus. Uh, in some of the red cases, um, particularly, I think it's, it's clear that this is a, a very big problem across the entirety of the United States. We're not just dealing with energy water nexus issues in the west. Um, we're dealing with them on the east coast as well. Um, some of the red issues, a lot of them have to do with um, the a water scarcity issue um, and high temperatures preventing effective thermal power uh, generation. Um, many of the green examples, um, particularly the one in Texas, um, which is the, the furthest one down if you're not familiar with all of the states, um, that uh, Texas is the biggest wind generator in the United States, generating between 10 and 18 percent of the total power matrix from wind. Uh, in 2011, Texas had the biggest one-year drought in its history. And, uh, and due to the wind power generation capacity in the state um, was able to prevent blackouts in that state due to a water scarcity issue impacting their thermal electric plants. Um, so again, I think we tend to, to look at water scarcity in the energy water nexus, but in the East Coast we also have a water abundance issue um, that manifests in flooding events that can impact our energy infrastructure um, in a similar way. So we saw, we saw this case with uh, Hurricane Sandy impacting um, the eastern seaboard, the eastern seaboard and bringing the grid down there. And so we use these examples in the United States to inform both lessons learned, success stories, and places where we can improve based on dialogues with other countries on where they have similar problems and have introduced innovative solutions. So we're looking to have that dialogue internationally based on our shared experiences. The State Department specifically um, is focusing on a couple of areas. These are very high level um, and so just want to introduce them. They're also aligned domestically with what the Department of Energy is, is, looking to, um, is looking to implement on their policy platform. So domestically and internationally, we are, um, we're talking about similar solutions to the energy water nexus. The first is um, to get data. Uh, we need to understand better the problem, the connections, the impacts by generating, using, and openly sharing improved sources of data. And I'll show an example of, of one um, of one case study that, that is doing that. Um, we can deploy technology. We've heard all of these solutions from, from everybody else so far. So internationally, we're all speaking the same language as well. Um, there's existing innovative off-the-shelf technologies that promote w energy and water efficiency. We can use non-traditional sources of water for energy production, and we can create water and energy from waste. And so these are, th these are solutions that we can start considering. We need to work together. This is also not news. Um, the energy and water decision makers must work together to ensure that decisions made by one sector don't impact the other. Um, we can help um, through the State Department and through USAID by strengthening institutions and establishing mechanisms for joint planning and development across the sectors internationally. And we can also use incentives um, and disincentives as an effective tool to encourage conservation of water and energy um, globally and domestically. Uh, we can start working together to create the policy and regulatory frameworks that strengthen local capacity and most importantly to enable businesses to serve as a catalyst for change in this sector. I'm just briefly going to go through two examples um, domestically. Many of you may be uh, familiar with the World Resource Institute's aqueduct. Um, this gets at the get data policy solution. Uh, this was a project that was launched, I believe, in 2008 or 2009 um, as a partnership with Coca-Cola um, to provide information on water supply globally um, and, uh, and helps to enable decision making around key resources and risk management. Um, and provides an example, so not only is it get data, but on the working together side of the policy solution example of businesses and governments working together to use data to address nexus problems. And this is just one example of, of a map produced by Aqueduct showing water stress um, and um, the dots are power plants. Domestically um, in the West, I am using Las Vegas uh, as, a, as an example. I think many people are familiar with Las Vegas. 
um, but this is a very dramatic visual example of Lake Mead, which is the lake behind Hoover Dam. Um, the difference in just 20 years of the water levels um, and what this means for a huge population living in a desert. Um, however, the, the solutions being pro, um, proposed and implemented at Las Vegas are similar across the western United States and, and similar programs are being implemented in Tucson, Arizona, Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and throughout the western United States. But again, very dramatic example of, of what's happening in the nexus in, in somewhere in the United States. That said, because of some of the water conservation and water efficiency standards that have been implemented um, in the region, uh, the water use by residents um, and by the, the um, business sector has decreased substantially. And you can see the big decrease from 650 gallons per day, which is excessive anywhere on Earth, um, to 75 gallons per day, which is more along the average um, in the United States. Uh, this was these, this change was created by incentives to customers to remove grass, um, to remove uh, water intense kind of plants in the region. They raised prices for water um, under the, um, in, in order to make infrastructure improvements. There's uh, heavy water recycling efforts and, and on the strip, um, the gambling strip there, uh, it's almost 100% water recycling. And they're also implementing leak prevention programs, which are saving millions of gallons of water um, a year. And so because of that, um, we can look at this, uh, just this image of a huge energy and, uh, and water use in, in Las Vegas and, um, and know that only 3% of the water budget here on the Strip is, um, is being used. And so that's due to water recycling and water efficiency measures. That said, more can be done. The water in Lake Mead continues to decrease, uh, and so proposals are being considered to implement more indoor conservation methods by installing water-efficient fixtures and appliances which could reduce water use in the home by 40%. Those are the end of my slides, but these are the types of things that we're interested in partnering um, with other governments and institutions globally um, to share our experiences and to try to work together and collaborate on solutions um, to address the, the global uh, issue of the energy water nexus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Well, as Diego said before, the U.S. is one of the countries that started leading the water energy work like about nine years ago. So it's very interesting to see what has been done. I think we don't have a lot of time, so maybe you can present and then we can take uh, questions for the two of you. Because I think we have, well, we're behind the schedule already. So. No, I don't have a presentation. Um, Thank you. I was tempted to ask a question and then I realized that would uh, only go down for my speaking time. I was not on the schedule, Alexander Verbeek, uh, and that also explains that I don't have overhead presentation. And I promised Diego I would keep it short. There are four points that I briefly want to mention. Um, first of all, what are we doing uh, with the water energy nexus in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? We are at the moment in the MFA in a time of huge budget cuts, a restructuring of the ministry and a focus on creating a modern, flexible network organization, uh, which is, is recognized for its expertise. Um, you, you see, for instance, that we get much more open and more visible, more transparent in social media. Um, the department where I work for was in the ministry where I'm, where I'm the strategic policy advisor is being recreated uh, actually from basically this week, uh, starting this week, um, as a department for global public goods. So what we've done in the ministry, we've put together uh, climate, energy, water and food in one department, uh, trying to be as efficient as possible on um, a, a nexus approach, not only in the kind of projects that we do where we have to look at this nexus approach, but also from, let's say, the, the geopolitical uh, impact, um, as well as, by the way, um, uh, the, the Dutch economic and, and business interest. Um, second thing, of the four things I want to mention, um, uh, as an example of what we are working on on nexus, um, 
we're in touch now with uh, the just mentioned World Resources Institute on what we are planning to do uh, in September in the World Water Week. Uh, some of the ideas we're uh, talking about, and I'll mention them here. If you have questions or comments, please come to me in, in the break afterwards. I would love to hear some, some comments back. Probably no time for it now. Um, one issue we want to discuss there is water risk and shale gas and everything related to that. We heard more about it this morning. A second thing uh, we want to discuss in the World Water Week is uh, water risk and coal power generation with China. You just saw on the WRI map uh, that Kelly presented, you saw this map of India with water stress in the north and you saw the black dots that are actually coal plants that they are that they're building there. This situation, especially in northern India and China, where the people and the coal are in one area, but water is in another area. Um, the water stress gets so severe that it uh, reduces, or in Indi India actually stops the possibilities of getting coal out of the ground because there's not enough water. That issue is the second one we want to touch upon, and the third one we would like to take time for in the World Water Week in, in Stockholm is uh, probably a full day session uh, on Asia with everything that has to do with the water energy nexus. So think about water coal, water shale gas, water and hydropower, um, uh, etc. And the Asian Development Bank is involved there as well. So any ideas, input you have, please come to me. Third thing I want to mention, uh, and the last one is a two-minute video. So this, um, uh, the one other thing I want to mention, the OMVS in Senegal, an example of an kind of energy nexus project that we were actually involved in before the whole world spoke about energy nexus projects. Um, the OMVS in Senegal, it's a cooperation uh, between Mali, Mauritania, Senegal and Guinea where they, these four countries cooperate on the management of the basin and they give an example how you can do this. They uh, cooperate on the use of fresh water they cooperate on the division of the electricity that is generated by the dams that are in there. And the interesting thing is the cooperation goes that far that even all the infrastructure that is built is collectively owned by those four countries. Um, the benefits are uh, divided among the countries. Mali gets, for instance, or at least Bamako, the capital, uh, gets the energy that's generated, whereas Senegal and Mauritania get uh, drinking water. Um, where does the Netherlands get in? Um, a problem is that, um, uh, well, this is typically an example where it is a successful nexus approach of water and energy. But with any project, you always have some, some losers. Always somebody is, is not happy, which is in this case the people at the end of the delta where uh, the percentage of fresh water is now so much higher that, for instance, a uh, plant is growing on the water that reduces the possibility for fishing. Uh, it creates health problems. You get more bilharzia. Uh, you get more malaria problems. And that's where we get in. We have an innovative way of getting rid of this plant that's growing on the water. Uh, it has resulted now in uh, more uh, agricultural production in that region, more fresh water and a healthier population. So this is typically, let's say, a lesson learned for these huge nexus projects that you always have to look at all the impacts and there's always people losing out on such a huge project. So make sure that you, that you take care of those aspects as well. That's what we're doing. The fourth thing, I said I would mention four things. The fourth thing I want to mention and give you that short video is uh, what the Netherlands is doing. Netherlands is always known for its water defenses. We have to be. I, I live a few meters below sea level. If you land at Schiphol Airport, you're four meters down on sea level. Some people get very nervous when they hear that when they arrive. Uh, but our dikes are okay. We have to make them higher. Sea level is rising and it will rise much more and we have a problem with the rivers to bring all that fresh water. Um, so we are, um, we have that reputation, but we also want to be known and we're working on it to uh, have uh, innovative ways of, of generating sustainable energy um, uh, while uh, protecting at the same time our country from upcoming water. 
So we use tidal energy, energy from tidal flows, together with blue energy, so energy from fresh and salt water combined, so we can contribute to the Dutch uh, renewable energy targets. Together with some European money, uh, we obtain more knowledge about the ecological aspects uh, and, and the governance aspects of all this. So together with companies and with knowledge institutes and the government, we're working on a way to make this a kind of strong export product because we know this, this can be used uh, in other delta areas in the world as well. And on top of that, the last thing I'm saying before I start the video, we're also looking at new ways for uh, decision making and governance on these kind of projects, which are also useful for, for other countries. I'll stop with the two minute video, otherwise it goes on. There is no two minute video. Does that mean, Diego, I got two more minutes to talk? Okay, I talk too much. I'll stop here. Uh, it's pity the video is, of course, normally it should be online. I just had it on my iPad. And, uh, okay, this is where you can access it. Uh, it's, it's, it's two minutes. It basically shows you what I just uh, described. I'll stop here. So I don't know if there are any questions either for Kelly or for uh, Alexander. Oh. <coughs> Hi, thanks very much for the presentations. I have a quick question for Kelly. Um, I thought that was very interesting. You started your presentation talking about the system of water rights in the U.S. and prior appropriation, riparian rights. I'm wondering to what extent do issues around allocation or access to water, water rights, water entitlements factor into the discussions that you have internationally in thinking about the water and energy nexus. Because clearly, depending on the country experience and where uh, energy is, is uh, categorized in the hierarchy of priority uses, that has a big influence on the extent to which energy companies might have an incentive to think about access to water. And internationally, um, I think there has been a lot of curiosity about how the United States manages its water resources, and I invite Mike to also um, contribute to this answer. Um, but uh, we we recently have started a, a series of pro well, it's not recent, but we've brought in um, governments who are interested in learning more about how. Um, the U.S. manages its water in what's called um, the IVLP, the International Visitors Learning Program, and governments who are interested in learning um, how we do things, whether it's on water or energy or human rights or anything, um, can apply to be a part of that program, and we bring representatives to the United States and tour them around the country um, to give them more in-depth answers. Um, for uh, given by the experts in those in those countries or in those states um, who can better answer those questions, but um, uh, but we do lean on the American experience um, and uh, and some of the complexity of it in terms of addressing issues pertaining to allocations, um, and we have many ways of, of of managing that depending on because it's such a localized issue. So um, we do have a breadth of knowledge um, whether or not our experience translates to other countries with stronger um, national policies uh, remains to be seen. Okay, thank you. Alexander, you know, one question to you. You know, if I understand correctly, now you try to include the water and the public goods. If that is the intention, you know, what perspective you look at this issue? Do you have any initiative study, policy study, or scientific study in that regard? Because it's quite new, quite, uh, I'm very uh, curious, curious about that. Thanks. You mean the last issue I spoke about, what, what we do in the Netherlands? Okay, yeah. Um, that the idea is that um, the way we worked up till now is in, in uh, about three years ago, we already put uh, uh, water and environment together with energy and resources. And we have now um, added food to it as well. So now that now we have, let's say, all these 
global public goods, but I don't want to start a debate on the definition of global public goods. I spent too much time of my life on what global public goods are, so I just used them now, let's say the environmental uh, or, the, or the sustainable global public goods. Um, the idea is that if we bring all these together, we can have more coherent policies, like, like the few examples I gave, and I think we're, we're going to do more of them. So, uh, yes, what are, uh, we mention it here as global public goods, but yes, we can have an enormous debate on uh, whether, you know, is it a human right, is it, can it be owned by companies, or can it be owned by people that are on the land, is it, is water from a country or not? What do the international treaties say about it? That you have to cooperate on transboundary waters, um, which probably too much for now to uh, to start a debate on. I'd love to continue during lunch if you if you want to, because we have that debate all the time. Can we use that word or not? Um, but we couldn't think of a better word to describe this department that we are creating at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for this really great presentation. Just a question, because the pictures look just too drastic and too interesting, seeing the lake meet them, well, what it was 20 years ago, what it was, what it is now. And the next slide said, despite that all these tremendous changes and improvements in water use efficiency which have been achieved. So what is the reason for the drastic lowering of the water level? Is there less water coming into the system or coming into the system through the interbasin transfers? Basically, what has happened with the water? And then a second question linked to what uh, Kathleen just has mentioned before is the west of the U.S. is mentioned as one of these examples about windfall profits can occur, occur from treating water rights because in the past, kind of people were triggered to move to the west by providing water infrastructure. And these days, when water has become scarce and the value of the scarce good has increased, if you trade your water rights, your irrigation rights for other purposes, some people have become quite wealthy with this. So is there any consideration how this should be tackled or triggered in terms of equity? I'll address the first question on uh, the drastic change in the, in the lake levels. Um, there's, uh, there's been a, a big population growth in the western United States um, that, that's driving some of the, the water use, but there's this region of um, of the United States has been subject to um, a decade-long drought now, so it's exacerbating um, the water. So there's less water coming in, uh, and there's also more people. And so, um, um, as many of us have noted, that necessity drives innovation. Uh, and so this is this is why I think the the stress in the system has driven places like Las Vegas to implement um, solutions to minimize their, their water use, which simultaneously min minimizes their, their energy use. Um, and so, but, but more can be done, and, and, and the lake level continues to drop, um, and, and Las Vegas is, is facing um, continued water stress. Uh, regarding trading water rights, this is not something that I know that much about. I will ask um, if Mike feels comfortable um, answering that question, and if not, um, I can find somebody uh, who is more knowledgeable about U.S. water law than I am uh, to answer your question. Hmm? In the western U.S., uh, water rights are identified as property rights, so it can be sold. So that's people that were there 300 years ago, 400 years ago, and had those property rights, and therefore they can sell them just like you would a piece of property. So there are some uh, places where there are some economic advantages. Um, I don't know that we've had anybody that's made a windfall, if you will, but there, uh, there are some legal requirements on all the states about how you can transfer water rights such to try to minimize any windfall profits, but, but they are classified as property rights and therefore you can sell and trade. Are there more questions? Or otherwise I think there's a World Water Day event right now. And I hope you have enjoyed our very long panel with the technology people 
the government, the private sector, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed and you learned a lot from me. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anna. Thank you very much, Diego, for putting together this very nice session and to all the governmental initiatives, you know, trying to influence government policies here. Um, we now we are going to start with the side event, and of course those who don't want to stay in the side event, they can leave, but I recommend you to stay because this is going to be important and uh, we're all trying to, to be uh, to make sure that we influence, you know, what is going to be said during World War Day. So, perhaps what we can do is to start with uh, presenting Adil Safar, who already we had yesterday, who is going to chair this session. But can I make a couple of logistic announcements first? You know, please go ahead and you can present the... Um, first of all, please, those of you who want to go to the technical visits, don't forget to sign in at lunchtime because otherwise, you know, people cannot get organized on logistics, so please do that. And right after the, the, the side event on World Water Day, we will be going downstairs to do the family photo and then we will have lunch, okay? Thank you very much. So, Adil, the floor is yes. yours. I, I take it that you will present your other speakers, yes, etc. Okay. 